Well, in my past, I was a very successful actor. You can call me Big Dick McGee, Big Dick for short. I want to see who I'm related to on 23andMe. Are you a fast talker? Are you a slow talker? Are you a con man? Are you not a con man? Are you technical? You can use the, the self conversations less sparingly. <laughs> you said to do it. <laughs> we had a lot of stimulus fraud. A whole sh ton of it. AI in 2024, it's going to ramp up. <laughs> I drink a lot. I still drink right now. I don't think we got any employees in Russia. That's a Chase Platinum. Holy shit. No fire today. He said to do it. <laughs> You're going to have to find out how to poo in front of other men. If I start fingering the scammers, not sexually, mind you, just, you know, pointing them out. Would you mind setting up a shell company for me? You look very trustworthy. <laughs> He's like, that son of a bitch just won't stop. <laughs> English speaking cyber criminals really like to talk. We really don't give a shit who we get our money from as long as we get it. That turd right there is the one I want to look at. Guess you guys didn't think I did it talking about turds. That's ready for you. <laughs> Everybody talks. I'm Brett Johnson, former United States Most Wanted, now good guy, and host of Criminal Thoughts. In today's world, criminals come in all shapes and sizes, but they all have got one thing in common. They've all got criminal thoughts. On today's episode, we are talking about how to identify cybercrime trends and, and how to shut their asses down. Why are we talking about that? Well, because I kind of just want to talk about that. That's not why we're talking about that. Why we're talking about that, we're talking about because I've been preaching for years about how to successfully dismantle cybercrime platforms. And I finally got to, I got to do a test on it just a couple of months ago when I hit Shark Tank and it worked beautifully. So we're going to talk about how that's done. We're also going to talk about how to identify cybercrime trends because it turns out Breddy is pretty damn good about identifying those things. Let's move right along, check in with Brian to see what he's got for us today. Hope you got jeans on for this one, Breddy. In December, 23andMe admitted that hackers had stolen the genetic data of 6.9 million users. The data breach started with the hackers accessing only around 14,000 user accounts. From these initial victims, the hackers were able to access the personal data of the other 6.9 million members because they had opted into 23andMe's DNA relatives feature. This optional feature allows customers to automatically share some of their data with people who are considered their relatives on the platform. Now facing more than 30 lawsuits from the site's victims, 23andMe is now deflecting the blame to the victims themselves in an attempt to absolve itself from any responsibility. Well, you know, there's nothing better than blaming the victim for the crimes that are perpetrated upon them. That's what I used to do. I lived by it, I died by it, and I went to prison for it. Looking back, if I could have been like 23andMe, Maybe I wouldn't have gone to prison. First of all, let's agree that the service is a bullshit service, okay? Why you're giving up your DNA to a third-party company so they can tell you who you are or are not related to or what ethnic background you've got, I'm sure I don't understand. Understand how this hack happened. What 23Me is saying is they're saying, well, these 14,000 users because they use the same or similar passwords across multiple websites, it's their fault. It's all their fault that the 6.9 million people were compromised. Nah, I don't think so. You see, the statistic is 
80% of the entire population uses the same or similar passwords across multiple logins. So passwords and logins across multiple websites. That's the, that's the actual statistic. There's not a company on the planet who doesn't know that. People tend to be idiots. Me, I'm an idiot. I am. Do I use the same or similar passwords and logins even though I used to be a cybercrime godfather? Yes. Yes, I do. Companies should understand that. Companies know that. So when you've got a user that's coming onto that platform and they're using a specific type of password, there are there are tools in place where that company can gauge and consider and, and identify if that password has been used by that user in other places as well. For 23andMe not to do that is negligence on their part. Not only that, but we're talking about 14,000 users. So what happens is, is this hacker, I'm going to call him a hacker because there's no, no better word for it. This hacker uses past breaches, gets the credentials, and then he uses this thing called credential stuffing. So what that is, is the hacker gets all these passwords and logins. He plugs them into an automated program. He goes to sleep at night. And while he's asleep, that automated program tries to log into tens of thousands of websites overnight. He wakes up the next morning. He's got your Hulu. He's got your tax records. He's got your credit cards. And he's got your little stupid ass 23andMe login. That's just 14,000. The way the site was set up is if you shared, you know, I want to see who I'm related to on 23andMe. So if you did that and click the little button, that allowed this attacker to get the personal data of the other 6.9 million users. Now, I'm going off on this a little bit because by God, it needs to be gone off on. To blame that on the victim is insanity. Let's be clear. The only person responsible for crime is the criminal, period. I do not care what the victim's done. I don't care if you're in the worst neighborhood in the world and you leave your front door open and you've got a shiny ass Rolex Daytona sitting on the, right there, the door seal with a sign that says, I'm gone for the next three days. You guys just come on in. No, it's not that victim's fault. That victim's a dumbass. Yes, but it's the criminal's fault because the criminal chooses the path and that choice, an active decision every step of the way in order to victimize the victim. 23andMe is blaming the victims for the crimes that are perpetrated upon them. The reason they're doing that is that 23andMe was negligent in their security practices. Recent cyber attacks reveal Wyoming's emergence as a hub for cyber criminals using limited liability companies as conduits. A recent cyber attack on the Somali journalists syndicate has been traced back to a Wyoming-based LLC, highlighting a growing trend of cyber criminals using U.S. shell companies for illicit activities. The digital sabotage, identified as a distributed denial of service or DDoS attack, was conducted with the assistance of an LLC shelled out of Sheridan, Wyoming. The state made registering anonymous shell companies so easy that foreign crooks don't have to be physically in Wyoming to hide out in Wyoming. That's interesting. Yo, here's the thing, Wyoming. I don't know if I've ever been to Wyoming. I heard that Wyoming has had sheep for decades, but only recently found out they could get wool from them. Just saying, just throwing it out there. Now, here's the thing, now all jokes aside, 56% of companies have experienced a breach because of third party access, okay? Most companies that allow third party access have no idea how many companies are accessing their system and those companies which access their system, they're never vetted. Meaning, what I'm trying to say is that the weakest device which accesses your system is exactly how strong your system is. Now, Wyoming, in all their infinite sheep-ridden wisdom, has decided that they're going to allow individuals to open up shell companies without really doing their due diligence about who or where those individuals are. And the way, the way they do that is they allow an authorized agent to open up the, these shell companies for them, meaning that I can be in Iran. Yeah, I can be in Iran and intent on doing a lot of damn damage. I can contact an authorized agent in Wyoming and say, hey, buddy, ha, would you mind setting up a 
shell company for me. Don't you worry your little head off. It's all going to be legal. I'm not going to do a thing about it. Everything's good. And that authorized agent's going to go, I trust you. You look very trustworthy. Even though you're in Iran, I know that many Iranians are fantastic people and you would never, ever try to attack any U.S. company. And that's what happens. We've seen this on more than one occasion. The Reuters article actually points out that this has happened at least four different times. If I'm running a U.S. company, say I'm running a merchant or retailer, okay? I'm selling bicycles just in the United States. If I see any traffic coming in from someplace outside of the United States, that probably raises a flag for me, or at least it should. I'm probably, if I'm doing correct security, I'm probably going to block any outside of the country traffic that's coming into my site because, hey, I'm not trying to sell to these people. I'm not trying to do business with these people because I'm strictly U.S. based. That counts in a tax as well. So if I'm trying to launch a DDoS attack or something like that, and I've got a U.S. company, I'm, I'm automatically filtering a lot or all of the traffic that's coming in, the, the packets that are coming in from outside the United States, because I'm not interested in that. I don't need that. That's, that's weird that it would be coming in. So what a lot of these attackers, a lot of these criminals are doing is they're using U.S. shell companies so that all the traffic doesn't come from outside of the United States. It comes from inside of the United States. That That's perfect for DDoS attacks. It's also perfect for varying degrees of fraud that take place across the, the online spectrum. Wyoming knows that this is happening because they've been told. They've been told at least four times already, and they're still letting it go. Why is that? Well, let's be honest here. Wyoming, even though I've not been there, Wyoming is known to be a little bit conspiracy minded. What I would absolutely consider doing if I were a company right now is is filtering and flagging a lot of the traffic that's coming in from those Wyoming based data centers that are out there. Um, Right now, we've only seen this happen with four or five companies. But what happens is, and I'll talk about that more in the in today's episode, what happens is, is cybercrime, these attack methods trickle down. It starts with one area and it becomes more ubiquitous and cheaper and easier to use until finally it spreads out to every single area where it can be useful. So bear that in mind. Watch any Wyoming companies that are out there. Watch any Wyoming traffic that's coming in. Go from there. Brian, let's carry on. Security executive Sean Henry says the capability of AI to deceive and misinform is just in time for the 2024 elections. AI has really put this tremendously powerful tool in the hands of the average person, and it has made them incredibly more capable, Henry explained. So the adversaries are using AI to overcome different cybersecurity capabilities to gain access into corporate networks. Henry highlighted AI's use in penetrating corporate networks as well as spreading misinformation online using increasingly sophisticated video, audio, and text deepfakes. Back to you, AI Brett. AI Bretty. I like that too. Maybe I'll get me a t-shirt, AI Bretty. Now, here, 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 here's the thing. I read that article and I reached out to Sean Henry over at CrowdStrike to ask if he would like to come on the show to talk about it. And he ignored my ass. Probably because I've been the guy for the past year and a half that said, hey guys, hey, here's the thing about AI. You talking about criminals using it? They're not using it right now. They will, but they're not using it right now. Here's the other thing. Um, Deep fakes, whether those deep fakes be uh, videos or voice, deep fakes were around a hell of a lot longer than the term AI has been in vogue for the past year, year and a half. Deep fakes have been very, very good. I hesitate to use the word AI with deep fakes, but let's go ahead and we'll play that ball game. What you're going to see is you're going to see, not right now, but later on, as it becomes easier to use, more ubiquitous, cheaper, user-friendly, all that bullshit, what you're going to see is you're going to see real-time deep fakes. 
and they're going to be very good. They're going to be so good that the good guys and all their little algorithms and security tools and products can't identify them in time to stop the attack. Now, what are those attacks going to look like? Well, those attacks are going to look like, imagine on the six o'clock news, you've got St. Louis, where Lord knows there's never any crime that happens in St. Louis, but you've got St. Louis and you've got a shooting on the six o'clock news. And that shooting shows those cops gunning down an unarmed assailant. And the city blows up. All right, riots happen. They burn it down like they did Minneapolis a couple of years ago, all that good shit. That's the video that's shown. A couple of three days later, though, we find out that that video was a deep fake, that actually the assailant did have a weapon in his or her hand, but the deep fake simply removed the weapon, causing the city to explode, but the damage is already done at that point. That's just one aspect. We've got aspects. Think about your financial markets. One of these CEOs comes out and says, hey, our company has went to shit. We are done. Sell everything as fast as you possibly can. Right now, AI and cybercrime, it's not that I disagree with Sean Henry. I actually, I actually agree with what he says that, hey, in 24, we're going to see AI ramp up in cybercrime. I absolutely agree with that. It's just that right now we're not really seeing that. I did, however, I did venture over to the dark web. Dum, dum, dum. And Breddy, your humble host, has decided to take us over to the dark web to see. I, so I was going on the dark web and on Telegram because the meat of today's episode has us visiting these two platforms. While I was there, I just got this wild hair in my ass saying, hey, I wonder if we can pull up anything on AI on Dread. Now, Dread is the Reddit of the dark web. Over on Dread, what we've got, this is the main page right here, okay? This was what came up on the main page of Dread, talking about incognito marketplace AI support review. So what's interesting, and I've said this in the past, what AI what I think that AI is initially going to do and help benefit criminal activity is by easing that heavy load. So think about romance scams. So a romance scam is a long-term scam. That scammer has to build and layer trust with that potential victim, not in the idea of just getting a one-time payment, but getting that potential victim to give every single cent that they've got to bankrupt them, okay? In order to do that, you have to build and layer trust over a, over a lengthy period of time with that potential victim. That takes a lot of criminal manpower hours. Now, if that criminal can offload that workload to an AI chatbot, that builds and layers trust with that victim until it gets to the point where the AI bot hands over that victim to a human, it becomes very effective. It, allow, it saves a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of work, and it allows that criminal to scale up operations and hit more victims overall. What we're seeing right now is on, on Incognito Marketplace and a couple of other criminal platforms, we're seeing AI services that, that are being used to ease the human workload as well. For, for example, on Incognito, if you've got a problem with your order, if you're trying to figure out something, if, you, if you're trying to complain, if you've got technical difficulties, anything else like that, instead of traditionally a human criminal taking that support and that support ticket and then working with you on that, now you've got an AI chatbot that handles most of that load immediately until they get to the point where the AI bot can no longer handle it and it hand, hands it off to a human. So this is the uh, the initial search that I did. It came up with 77 different results. Talking about, of course, incognito marketplace. Um, let's go on down here a little bit. Proof that Dread is corrupt. Well, we may talk about that on another episode, how the developer of Dread, Hugbunter, is not as sparkling white as driven snow as one would think. We'll talk about that on a later episode. But it keeps going down. And then, you know, you've got a couple of decent articles that were written about um, AI as well. So this is the, this is a guy that's he's titled his post research and development. And what he's talking about is how AI is used by anti-fraud groups or anti-fraud security services. 
in order to identify fraudsters. And this same guy over here called a dissertation of fraud. He basically says the same thing. And, and it's worth reading. Um, shit, let's take the time to read it. Why not? We got nothing but time. I'm paying everybody here by the hour and they are more than happy to sit here as long as my ass will gap. So let's go ahead and read it. We're totally All fine right. with this. <laughs> Do what? We're totally fine with this. I figured. He says this is a dissertation on AI anti-fraud. And he says, this is a longer post aimed at more technically inclined individuals. You have been warned because he knows that most cyber criminals are fucking idiots. I've got a term for it. It's called FIS, fucking idiot syndrome. Most cyber criminals suffer from it. I intermittently suffer from it, but most of them are longtime sufferers. Now let's go right ahead. He says, AI anti-fraud will be referred to as AIAF which is different than F-A-F-O. So is that, yeah, F-A-F-O. Yeah. AI fraud tools will be referred to as AIFT and LOC is line of credit fraud. So just to read this here, first and foremost, to understand any concepts of countering AI anti-fraud, we have to understand what it is. For the sake of simplicity, I don't want the nomenclature to be too confusing. So to sum it up, Anti-fraud AI is the overarching use of artificial intelligence models to depict and analyze a static or dynamic number of parameters to identify whether a user is making an honest or otherwise fraudulent use of identity and or other sensitive information. So you can probably tell this guy who is writing this right off the bat is not a dipshit, at least he doesn't come off as one. He's using quarter words instead of dime words. Me, I'm more the dime word type guy. So to carry on, the reasoning behind this thesis is to give a better understanding of the anti-fraud measures being put in place to prevent us from being profitable. Because at the end of the day, we as criminals, I know I used to be one, we as criminals, we like to profit. The first and best way to counter AI anti-fraud is to act like a human. No shit, Sherlock. No matter how advanced AI gets, we will always be human. I mean, kind of goes without saying. This is the greatest leverage we have against anti-fraud AI. No matter what type of fraud you are executing, build a human fingerprint, act natural, do not get sloppy. AI can act as human as it wants. AI can act as human as it wants. It might even be damn good at it, but we will always be better. One thing that has piqued my interest, however, is the idea of I have no friggin' clue what this idiot is trying to say. Internal mistakes, initial mistakes, some sort of mistakes. He made a mistake typing the damn word out and it's ruined everything. Anyway, humans make mistakes. It would only make sense that the fingerprints we build to defraud an institution or person would be someone out of the ordinary. Nothing jeopardizing the play, but just enough to make it seem realistic. I will be digging into the specifics of AI anti-fraud parameters in the next paragraph. So I... I'm already tired of reading this guy, so we're just going to kind of end it as, at, at that. Now, what he's saying is is, 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 is is pretty much true. If you think about AI anti-fraud systems, traditionally, we've had a rules-based system, meaning that the, 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 the computer system, the, that whole merchant experience has rules in, in place, meaning that if you um, come in with an IP address that's more than 25 miles outside of the home area, that it raises a flag, meaning that if it's being shipped to an alternate address, it raises a flag, meaning if um, the phone number is not correct or the address is not correct, it raises a flag. Um, all these different things raises flags and you get a fraud score. And based on how, how high the fraud score is, the order will go through or will not go through. So a rules-based type system, there's many different types of rules that are in there. Then we have, we've got machine learning, which hopefully kind of sort of maybe adapts as it goes along. So it, 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 you're, you're giving it rules and it sees everything that's coming in and it continues to adapt as things go along, which is different than AI, meaning that the machine itself is learning and instituting as it goes along. OK, and anticipating very, very effective. The idea from a fraud perspective, from a criminal perspective, 
is that if I'm coming into an environment, I want to look as natural. This guy says, you know, you're picking not so ordinary victims. That's not true. You want to look as natural as you possibly can. For example, if I'm using stolen credit card details and I'm trying to defraud Apple, I'm not going to go to the Apple store online and order three MacBook Pros because no son of a bitch on the planet does that legitimately. You immediately know that that shit is fraud. So you don't order three MacBook Pros. You order one MacBook Pro maxed the fuck out. You order a monitor and then you order whatever nice little expensive ass data drive is there as well. You get the same dollar amount, but it doesn't raise the same types of flags that are there. Better yet, you get three credit cards and you order a MacBook Pro on one, a monitor on the other, and then that data drive on the third card. And you do it like that. And it's only going to cost you like 60 bucks more at the end of the day. That's how you properly commit fraud. You try to look as normal as possible. You try to anticipate what that actual customer would do. And there are ways you do that. So you, if, you, if you're if you buying stolen credit card details, you look at the BIN. The BIN is the bank identification number. The first six digits of that card will tell you the bank, the issuing bank and the type of card that it is. That's a Chase Platinum. Holy shit. Happy day. Happy day. So you do stuff like that. You look at the victim themselves. You may, do, you may pull up the victim's Facebook or LinkedIn to see, okay, do they have money or have they worked at Pizza Hut for 40 years? That will tell you the types of orders that this person typically does. So you, you try to act like the actual customer as much as you possibly can because you want to go in that environment and not raise any flags. That's how you do this stuff, okay? What he's talking about with AI is, yeah, at the end of the day, you're human. You absolutely are. But Long story short, as long as you're acting as as legitimate as you possibly can within the confines of that criminal activity, you are probably going to be able to bypass any type of AI anti-fraud that's out there. He also says later on down in the paragraph that, hey, you know what would be really a lot of fun if criminals sat down and learned how to use the AI anti-fraud tools as well, because that will help them commit the crime. He's absolutely friggin' right. He's absolutely right. Uh, what you see more times than not is that criminals will use existing off-the-shelf products and services. A lot of security or pen testing products and services are done like this all the time. They will use those for criminal means. It's not about inventing the wheel. It's about innovation because innovation breeds supremacy from a criminal's perspective every single day. Uh, AI in 2024, it's going to ramp up. It absolutely is. Uh, I don't think that 2024 is going to see uh, the widespread use of uh, real-time deep fakes. I do think we're going to see more of the um, AI being used to, to carry or lift that heavy burden from the criminal side until it hands off to a human attacker. Um, other than that, we'll just have to wait and see what happens. Brian, let's move on. Okay, so today's criminal insight of the week, the three necessities of cybercrime. For cybercrime to be successful, three things have to take place. You have to gather data, you have to commit a crime, and then finally you have to be able to cash that crime out. All three necessities have to work in conjunction. If they don't, the crime fails, why even try? The problem is, is that a single attacker, one guy, can't do all three things. He can do one, sometimes two, but rarely all three, and that, is why you see the Darknet, Telegram, the uh, surface web groups, the deep web groups, they exist so that that one specific criminal can network with other criminals who are good in areas where he, sometimes she, is not. Now, what do I talk, what do I mean by those three necessities? Gathering data, committing crime, cashing out. Gathering data, that is the stolen PII. That's the credentials that are used. That's your bank account details. It's uh passwords, logins, it's any tool that may be needed to you to to help launch the attack that goes under the gathering the data aspect. OK, committing the crime is exactly what it says. Once I gather that data, the tools that I need, I go off and I defraud the bank, the government, who have you. And then finally cash things out. What am I looking for at the end of the day? Because I'm looking for one of four things. I'm looking for information, access, data or cash. Now, what's interesting here 
is that those three necessities of cybercrime dictate that it is never a single attacker which seeks to victimize you or your organization. It's always a group of people. Now, why is that? Two reasons. The first is a problem with skills. That specific attacker simply does not understand how to do one of those three necessities. Or maybe he does, but someone else is better at it than he is. And that typically falls under the gathering the data aspect of things. Okay, so he may not know how to launch a man in the middle attack. He may not know how to launch a phishing campaign, any number of things like that. So he lets the marketplace fulfill that need, that necessity. Then he goes off and commits the crime, cashes things out at the end of the day. The other issue is a problem with geographic location. That attacker is simply in a geographic area where they cannot fulfill one of those three necessities of online crime, typically cashing out, laundering money. So you take like during the pandemic, for example, during the pandemic, we had a lot of stimulus fraud, a whole shit ton of it. A lot of the attackers were not in the United States. They were in Russia. They were in the Ukraine. They were down in South America. They were in the United States as well. But here's the thing. So gathering the data, everyone's information is out there. So that aspect was very easy to fulfill. Committing the crime. There was no security in place for at least six months. Six months. So security was not an issue. Committing the crime was not an issue. But if you are in the Ukraine or in Russia and you're filing unemployment claims in California, yeah, those claims will go through. But when you go to withdraw the funds from an ATM in Russia, probably it's going to raise a few flags. I don't think we got any employees in Russia and it's going to fail at that point. So they had to rely on money mules stateside to fulfill that necessity of cybercrime. And that's the lesson of the day. It's, it's never a single attacker which seeks to victimize you or your organization. And the three necessities of cybercrime for it to be successful, you have to gather data, you have to commit a crime, and you have to cash that crime out. So today's episode, I know we've been a while getting to it because you know I like to talk. Today's episode is identifying cybercrime trends and how to shut their asses down. Now, here's the thing. This is, I'm embarrassed to say that this is the second attempt to record this episode because the first attempt really had me just kind of, <laughs> I talked more than any white person on the planet not to say anything. So Brian was more than kind. He's like, oh, it's fine. Meanwhile, I knew the entire time he was sitting there going, man, that son of a bitch. He didn't say a thing for an hour. I was like, hey, let's record this again. And and he was very gracious when he quickly said, probably not a bad idea, Brittany. <laughs> so we're recording it again. And hopefully this time it makes a little bit more sense for everyone. I'm called the original Internet Godfather. Um, it's not it's a moniker that opens doors. All right. Once those doors are open, we have to see what Brady can bring to the table as far as value goes for modern day times. But that that idea of being a godfather of cybercrime, I was on the ground floor of seeing a lot of the different types of frauds and crimes being transitioned from the brick and mortar world to the online world and figuring out what that looks like. So so I've got a lot of experience and knowledge when it comes to how these crimes actually operate. That's compared to today's cyber criminal. Back when I was a criminal, not just me, but those other guys, Albert Gonzalez, uh, Roman Vega, Dmitry Golubov, all these other guys as well. You had to understand every single aspect of the crime that you were committing. Every dynamic you had to understand. You had to understand the security of the platforms. You had to understand how the products that were working or you had to build the products yourself. You had to understand credit card security. You had to understand what's called operational security today. So how to remain anonymous because if you don't practice good operational security, your ass is going to go to prison and you're going to have to find out how to poo in front of other men because that's a hard thing to do when you first go to prison. This is what happens. So you have to have operational security. You have to understand every, you have to know how to run drop addresses. You have to know how to launder money. You have to learn everything as you go along. Today, it doesn't work like that. Today, you have cybercrime as a service and those people who are profiting 
really don't need to understand any single dynamic of any single crime that they're committing. The reason I say that, other than doffing my own hat, the, the reason I say that is understanding those things, even back then, allows someone like me to look at the current environment of cybercrime, what's happening, and to be able to predict very successfully, oftentimes, to be able to predict what those trends are or what's coming online that people need to be aware of. Now, in the past, I'm the first guy on the good guy's side that's talked about refund fraud. I'm the first guy on the good guy's side that's talked about synthetic fraud. Now, are those things important? Yeah, you goddamn right they're important. Synthetic fraud is 80% of all new account fraud. It's the fastest growing form of identity theft on the planet. It's 20% of all credit card chargebacks. It's 5% of all overall credit card debt. It's over $50 billion industry for criminals. So yeah, it's pretty important. Refunding fraud. Refunding fraud redefined cybercrime as we know it. So yeah, these are things that are important. So how do you identify Trends, you have to have a background and experience knowing the history of things in order to anticipate the future of things. I guess the question is going to be, well, Brett, that's all good and dandy. That helps you to no end. But how does that help me if I'm just getting started in cybersecurity and I'm looking to try to identify the trends or what's going to take place in cybercrime? We're going to talk about that today because this is what becomes really important, okay? It boils down to you have to look at the environment, the problems that criminals are facing, not that the good guys are facing. You look at the problems that criminals are facing, and then you need to see what needs to be done on that criminal side to succeed. So before we get into that, what becomes important is you have to be able to enter these environments. You have to go to these environments know which ones to go to, and then just kind of lurk around and gain that experience. You Through osmosis, if nothing else, you sit on your ass and hopefully you'll soak it up like that. But whatever that is, you're going to just sit on that platform and you're going to learn the dynamics of that platform. You're going to learn how, how everything operates. You're not really going to say anything. You're just going to sit there, lurk, learn. All right. Now, in order to do that, You've got to have an online identity called a legend from the good guy and law enforcement perspective. So what is a legend? A legend is simply a created fictitious online identity that has nothing to do with you. All right. So there's a reason and you see this very common. You'll see on Dread, on Telegram, on um nulled any of these, you know, hacking or cybercrime platforms, you will see typically a fraud analyst, a cybersecurity professional, or woe be unto everyone, law enforcement that will come on a site. How did they identify that individual as being someone that was not interested in real criminal activity. They weren't they were interested in criminal activity on the stopping it side, not on the doing it side. So how did they recognize that person as being that? Well, that person comes in, they don't really understand the history or the background of cybercrime. They don't understand how these people operate. They come in and they use semantic, they use word verbiage from the good guy side. So they'll come in and they'll ask a question about triangulation fraud. Bad guys don't call it triangulation fraud. They'll ask a question about synthetic identities. The bad guys don't call it synthetic fraud or synthetic identities. So they'll come in and start asking these questions or start posting stuff that just doesn't read right. You know, it, it's you're, you're saying something that isn't quite right. It doesn't make sense what you're saying. You're talking about something too soon for you to say it, for you to be the skill level that you claim that you are. It just doesn't sound right. So that's why it becomes important to sit down before you enter these environments. OK, before you even go there, you need to make sure all your ducks are in a row. And it starts with understanding that. 
you're coming in. It's basically role play. You're coming into that environment with a different identity than the person who you actually are. You're, you're not coming into the environment as a fraud analyst or as a law enforcement or as a security professional. You're coming in the environment as a criminal. But it goes deeper than that. That identity that you're coming in with has to be completely different than the person that you are. So you have to actually sit down. And this is where I've had these comments before. And I give an interview and I say, you know, in my past, I was a very successful actor. Some of the comments say, well, you know what? He's probably acting right now. All that tears and all that bullshit. That's probably him crying on cue right now. So you got those people. And I've got to say you're wrong on that. But you've got other people that say that that acting background probably helped you commit fraud and victimize companies and individuals. And to that, I say you are completely 100% correct. It absolutely helps that. So this is what we're talking about when we're creating a legend. You sit down and you have to figure out who this person is. Where were you born, boy? What type of background do you have? Did you have a good childhood? Were your parents well off? Were they poor? When did you begin crime? What type of crime did you begin? What type of education background do you have? What part of the country are you from? Have you moved around a lot? Were your parents in military or were they just nomadic? Or were you stationary a lot of the time? Because that will help inform the type of criminal activity you, you, you've committed, how you've grown up in that environment. If you've got friends, associates, no friends, things like that, it helps inform everything. So you have to sit down with a little notepad even. Sit down, you start plotting it out. Okay, so my name is Brett Johnson, but I don't want to be Brett Johnson. I want to be... Uh, I want to be Richard Head. You can call me, you can call me Big Dick McGee. Big Dick for short. Let's not say that, but we, you could do that. All right, so my name's going to be Richard Newt, Newton, but I'm not going to tell anybody that, but that's my name. And I come from, uh, I was born in New York, but we migrated down. We moved down. My dad was in the military. Um, he drank a lot. Yeah, my dad drank a lot. So he was, you know, he was he was checked out a lot of the time. He was very abusive. My mom, uh, she slept around a lot on my dad. Uh, so it was just me there most of the time by myself and where he moved around a lot. I didn't have a whole lot of friends. Um, do I drink or not? So dad drank. Mom, mom slept around a lot. Yeah, yeah, I drank too. I drank a lot. I still drink right now. And we moved around a lot. As you figure all this stuff out, how many years of college did you graduate? What did you, what did you major in? Did you go to college? How were you in high school? Did you play sports? Did you not play sports? You figure out all this stuff. No, you not only do that, but you go even deeper into it. What type of physique do you have coming in? Because if you if you're thin, that's different than if you if you're fat and you've got those fat pudgy fingers that mistypes a lot of words. You're hitting the keyboard. Are you one handed typer or are you two handed typer? You got to figure out all this stuff because it helps inform who you are online. Even before you come up with a screen name, it helps inform every single bit of that. OK, so that finally, how do you walk? Where's your center of balance? What do you believe in? And you figure out all this kind of stuff, and that's coming to build the legend. So, you, so instead of becoming Brett Johnson, you become maybe a, you know, maybe some guy. I'm just trying to learn how to make some money, man. That's all I'm trying to do. I'm trying to learn how to make some money. I don't really know how to make money. They told me I could come to Telegram. I could make all the money in the world. Maybe a little bit more faster talking. Maybe you're faster talking. You're coming from, you know, you're coming from the south. You're laid back, though. You like the rap music. <laughs> I like me some rap music. Whatever that is, you're doing that. But you got to figure out. You got to figure out what that character is. Are you a fast talker? Are you a slow talker? Are you a con man? Are you not a con man? Are you technical? Are you technical or are you not? You got to figure out all that. Once you figure that out, then and only then do you come up with a screen name because that will absolutely inform what that fucking screen name is. OK, or, you know, you're a lit guy. So you come up with uh, Lord of the Rings, Gollum fun, something like that. OK, that's what informs that. Now you're in the environment. Now you've went in there. And the idea at that point is to simply gain 
that experience. And how do you gain that experience? By watching and learning what everyone's talking about, what they're doing, what they're saying, how they're behaving. That's what you do. You don't even say a friggin' word. You just go in and lurk. That's all you're going to do is lurk. Once, and it's going to take a few weeks, once you understand that environment enough is when you start to interact. You've got the language down. You understand your own background and your own skill levels and your own history of crime before you've come into that environment. And that allows you to carry on conversations with people who know what it should be without raising any flags. So you start to gain that experience. So we're talking about identifying trends, okay? So understanding the history of cybercrime, take for example, refunding fraud, okay? So if I know the history of re refunding fraud, and I by God do, if I know the history of refunding fraud, I know it starts back around 2013 with people saying, hitting Amazon, saying that their package did not arrive. Amazon would reship another one. You would claim that package did not arrive. And then Amazon would give you a refund. That went on for a while because Amazon makes more money than God. And they didn't really recognize that the fraud was happening. But after a while, they realized that, oh, shit, it's eating us alive. So they started to enact security. The crime started to change. That created a problem on the criminal side. So what needed to happen in order for that to still work as a fraud. So criminals adapted. Instead of saying, hey, it didn't arrive. The box got here. The box got here. But the, uh, the, 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 the item wasn't in the box. I mean, the yeah, the, yeah, the retail box is here. It's here. I'm looking right at the retail. I've opened, yeah, I've opened the retail box. But it ain't here. It's, 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 the laptop ain't there. That actually worked. That bullshit works. It works to this day to a degree, depending on the company that you're going to hit. So that became the next excuse. Amazon, after several more months of fraud, Amazon then started to tweak that. They started to weigh and video the packages, creating another problem on the criminal side. So how do you solve that? Well, they started to say, well, OK, so <sighs> did not arrive is not working too well. Not in the box is not working too well. So, you know, it would be really neat. It would be really neat if the package was lost in transit or if I could make it look like the package was sent back for a refund, but it wasn't. I wonder if I could do that. Turns out you can. And the way you do it is called FTID, fake tracking identification. You can manipulate the shipping label to make it appear that the package was either lost in transit or was delivered back for a refund and never was. And that is very successful even today. It's eating almost every merchant and retailer alive. But there are some companies that are, that are starting to enact more security. So now it creates yet another problem on the criminal side. How do you solve that? So the next thing is, is did not arrive, doesn't work. Not in the box is shit. FTID, eh, I can't hit this store with that. It would be really good. <sighs> it would be really good. <laughs> it would be really good if we could get an insider that works at UPS, FedEx, or DHL. <laughs> that would be, that would be great. So that's what's going on right now is you've got that. So depending on the company that you're hitting, you can do any of those four things to successfully commit refunding fraud. And you see what's happened there. You've started with a fraud. Company has enacted security. You've got a problem on the criminal side. What does it take to succeed? Company enacts security. Problem, succeed, security, bam, 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 back and forth. Proactive, reactive. Fraudsters are always proactive, by the way. So if you can understand the way that process works, 
then you start to understand how to predict cybercrime trends, understanding that you've got a trickle-down theory of cybercrime. So a product or service or technique, an attack technique that's taking place, it always starts with one specific vertical of crime. For example, uh, SIM swaps. SIM swaps started by stealing cryptocurrency. And then over time, SIM swaps trickled down to every single aspect of cybercrime where it was beneficial. It actually got to the point where they were doing account takeovers, taking over people's credit card accounts using SIM swaps, which was unheard of when SIM swaps first started because they were very expensive. These days they're not horribly expensive to do that and they're much easier to do as well because the phone companies are negligent when it comes to enacting proper security. Understand that that trickle down theory of cybercrime, understand what we've talked about of how cybercrime operates with creating problems from criminals and then overcoming those problems. And then you can start to anticipate how to identify cybercrime trends. And since we're talking about refunding fraud, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. Refunding fraud typically starts with a person using their real name, their real address, their real bank or credit card account to defraud a merchant. So I'll use Brett Johnson, my bank account, my address. I'll uh, contact, I'll order something from the Apple store, that MacBook Pro, and then I'll do refunding fraud. I'll do an FTID. I'll tell them I'm sending it back for, you know, full refund and it'll make it look like they've received it. They'll think they've received it, but they've not. Okay. And I get to keep that MacBook. I get to get my money back as well. The problem with that is that if I'm using my name, my credit card, my address, I can only do that so many times before, hey, that shit's done. You, you've already opened up all the credit card accounts you've got. You've used your address so many times that nobody's shipping any goddamn thing to that address. You, you've started to use your family's addresses so many times that you can't do that anymore. So what the hell are you going to do, man? What's happened in the past is that refunding criminals have used prepaid debit cards and they used gift cards. Once they've mined out all the bank accounts they've got and the credit cards, they had no real choice but to start using prepaid debit cards and gift cards. So from a merchant or retailer perspective, it becomes extremely easy to identify who those potential refund fraudsters are. You get a brand new account that signs on, they're paying for that MacBook Pro with gift cards, and within a week, they're asking for a refund. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that, yeah, this guy's probably trying to rip our asses off. So they start to flag that, creates a problem. Remember that? Creates a problem. How does a criminal overcome that problem? And this comes into the trickle-down theory of cybercrime synthetic fraud. It's called CPN on the criminal side in case anybody's wondering credit profile or credit privacy numbers, but synthetic fraud, that, that idea of creating a fictitious individual that is then used to defraud historically a bank or credit card company. Okay. So synthetic fraud is uh, the way that it actually operates. 2011, the Social Security Administration, they randomized Social Security numbers. They did that to defeat a specific form of identity theft, meaning that if you're issued a Social Security number prior to 2011, if I have the last four digits of your social, if I know your date of birth and the state you're born in, it's very easy, very easy for me to get the first five digits. Social Security Administration said, we got to stop that shit. So they randomized the numbers. So you can no longer tell when the social was issued, who it was issued to. That stops that type of fraud dead in its tracks. That identity theft dies for anybody that's issued a social security number after 2011. And when they do that, it creates synthetic fraud. So now I can use a child's social security number or I can fabricate a social security number just using the social security algorithm and attach a name to it an adult date of birth. Credit card companies or credit bureaus don't know you exist until you tell them you exist. So what happens is I go on the dark web. I buy a kid's social security number for $2. I add a name to it, an adult date of birth, an address, a phone number. I apply for credit. 
Credit bureaus don't know you exist until you tell them you exist. So they, if they've never seen that data before, that application for credit is denied. But when it's denied, it actually creates a credit report in that credit bureau system. So now you've got that ghost in the machine, okay? The identity is there in the credit bureau. It's there. It's a very thin file, no credit history. The idea is to pump up the credit history as, as positive and as quickly as possible, okay? And you do that by what's called credit piggy, piggybacking, authorized user trade lines. We won't go into that because that's not what this show is about. But you can go from a zero to a high 760 plus in 45, 60 days. And it has an extra benefit that, yeah, you just opened up this credit report. It's maybe, you know, two months old, but an authorized user trade line will actually change the date of that synthetic credit report to several years old of all positive credit history. So that type of crime started and has remained in the vertical of defrauding banks and credit card companies. But what we're seeing now is that synthetic identities are being used by refund fraudsters. They're being used by refund fraudsters because that allows them to continue to open up credit cards and bank accounts to defraud who? No, not credit card companies and banks, but merchants that they're hitting with refund fraud. That's how cybercrime works. And that is how you identify cybercrime trends. You look at where things have been. You look at what's going on. The problems or the potential problems that are going to be caused to criminals committing crime. And then you start to anticipate how do they overcome that? What do they, and you do a lot of brainstorming. Basically, you throw a lot of shit up against the wall and you see what sticks. But that shit that you throw up against the wall, depending on your experience, how much you learn, how much you know about those criminals and criminal environments and the fraud that's going on, that will allow you to look at all that shit on the wall and say, you know what? That turd right there is the one I want to look at. That's what I want to say is going to happen at the end of the day. And that is how you identify cybercrime trends. So that's the first part of today's episode. Guess you guys didn't think I did it talking about turds. That's ready for you. <laughs> What's interesting, I was arrested. So Shadow Crew makes the front cover of Forbes, August 2004. Headline, Who's Stealing Your Identity? October 26, 2004, United States Secret Service, they arrested 33 people, six countries, six hours. Yours truly was the only individual publicly mentioned as getting away. They picked me up four months later, gave me a job. And as most people know by now, I'm that idiot that continues to break the law from inside Secret Service offices for the next 10 months until they find out about it. I take off on a cross-country crime spree, steal $600,000 in four months, wake up one morning on the United States Most Wanted list, go to Disney World, get arrested, sent to prison, escape prison, get caught again, serve out my time. Now, back then, law enforcement did not really understand any single aspect or dynamic of crime. They did not know who these people were committing crime. They didn't understand us. They did not know how the crimes were being committed. They did not know how to identify the people, and they certainly did not know how to stop it. They, too, suffered from what I like to call FIS, fucking idiot syndrome. They were not receptive to me calling them fucking idiots. They frowned on that greatly. We used to talk a lot. And when I was in the offices, we, we talked frequently about, Brett, how would you shut down these cybercrime environments? And way the hell back then, we're talking, shit, this is, you know, 2005, 2006. Way the hell back then, I was preaching this back then. You cannot, even back then, you cannot, you could not arrest your way 
out of the problem. Back then, there were so many cyber criminals that, hey, you're not going to arrest them all. It's too profitable. It's too easy to do. There's too many of them. You're not going to do that. So what you have to do is you have to look at the environments that they're in and how to shut down those environments. And, and just to put things into perspective for you, I like throwing out statistics today. So you've got over 37,000 FBI agents in the Bureau spread across 56 field offices. Of those 37,000 plus agents, only about 280 of them concentrate on cybercrime. The SBA, the Small Business Administration, when all of that stimulus fraud was going on and everyone was making buku bucks on SBA farm loans, Across the entire United States, you only had three, one, two, three investigators. So you've got a manpower problem. You've, you've got a jurisdictional problem. You've got all these issues that, that mean it's very hard to prosecute these people. Not only that, but the Internet itself lends itself to anonymity, as long as you know what the hell you're doing. Meanwhile, cybercrime. Shadow Crew ends with 4,000 members. Fast forward to 2017, largest criminal group, Alpha Bay, ends with 240,000 members. Fast forward two more years to 2019. Just a dark web marketplace called Black Market, 1.15 million members. All of that pre-pandemic. What happened during the pandemic? Well, those fraud numbers exploded. Add in things like refunding fraud, which redefines cybercrime. And now today, you've got cybercrime groups and communities that are millions of members large, all of them looking to profit at the end of the day. You can no longer arrest your way out of this problem. So it becomes this idea of how do you disrupt those cybercrime platforms and communities to where no one's using them. Because if you can't arrest everyone and you're really trying to stop crime, it becomes how do you poison that well where everyone's going to? So to backtrack here, one of the things that Shadow Crew was really good about and, and another doff of my hat, I'm responsible for instituting the trust mechanism that's currently used on most efficient successful cybercrime platforms. And remember, I, I talked about the three necessities of cybercrime, gathering data, committing crime, cashing out. All three have to work in conjunction. A single attacker can't do that. So he has to network with other criminals or attackers who are good in those areas where he, sometimes she, is not. In order to do that, you have to be able to trust that fellow criminal. The problem is, is that other person is a criminal. They're looking to make money. So how can you trust, if, if you're hitting a bank for 10, 20, $100,000, how do you trust that, that person, that's, that, that money mule is going to give you your 60% of the loot? But there's three sites. There's Counterfeit Library, Shadow Crew, Carter Planet. I built and ran Counterfeit and Shadow Crew. All right. Before Counterfeit Library and Shadow Crew, the only avenue you had to network with other online criminals was IRC, Internet Relay Chat. Rolling chat board. You had no idea who you were talking to, if you could trust them, if they had a product or service, if they had it, if it worked, or if they were just going to rip you off because everyone there was a crook. Shadow Crew solved that. I sat down as we transitioned from counterfeit library to shadow crew with counterfeit library. The trust mechanism was me every, and I mean every single business transaction that took place on counterfeit library went through me with shadow crew. We transitioned. I sat down over the space of a couple of weeks and I came up with a, with a review system and here's how that works. Okay. So I established that trust mechanism, the way trust works Worked on Shadow Crew, it works that way on the traditional dark web now, is you have a large communication channel, a forum type structure where individuals from different time zones can reference conversations days, weeks, months old, take part in those conversations, learn from those conversations. You know by looking at someone's screen name what the skill level of that individual is, what the history of that individual is. Because on traditional dark web marketplaces or forums, 
the person's screen name becomes that person's brand. We had vouching systems in place. We had escrow systems in place. We had review systems in place, all with that singular idea of establishing trust with one criminal and another when they didn't know what each other looked like, would never meet, and never would know each other's real name. That is what strive and lives on today in dark web forums and marketplaces is that trust mechanism. Now, things have, have been added to that as time has went on. But that trust mechanism is extremely valuable and necessary for cybercrime to be efficient and successful. You have to be able to trust your criminal peers. If you can't, you're going to get eaten alive. And that's one of the problems with Telegram that we're going to talk about here in just a little bit, okay? We're now on the dark web. So the dark web has a lot of friction to it. Friction meaning the interruption of the customer experience, okay? So understand that using the dark web, the Tor browser, it starts with you have to go to Tor project, you have to download it, you have to configure it properly because if you don't, your ass is gonna get identified and go to jail if you commit criminal activity. So it's got a lot of friction out of the gate. Once you get everything configured and downloaded properly and everything else, then you have to know where the hell you're going to because Tor doesn't have a search engine. So you have to know the specific site because if you get the site wrong, guess what? There are predators in those waters. Those waters ain't safe. There are people out there looking to rip you off because believe it or not, criminals are criminals. We really don't give a shit who we get our money from as long as we get it. So you've got criminals that are out there victimizing other people. So you have to know where the hell you're going. As such, this site right here is dark.fail. Because there's so many criminal phishing sites out there, you've got sites that are dedicated to informing you where the legitimate criminal marketplaces and forums are. Dark.fell is one of the premier ones. And you'll see here, it tells you which sites are currently up, what the sites are. So you've got Dread, which is the Reddit of the dark web. You've got Recon, which is offline right now. You've got the Libra Forum. You've got the Archetype Criminal Marketplace. You've got the Incognito Marketplace, which has the AI function that people either love or hate that we discussed earlier. And you've got the different links that are there. And that's, this is what an onion link looks like right here. So you see, it's, it's something that you really have to know where the hell you're going. And it's very easy to come up with a fake site that would fish you out, get your credentials, steal all your cryptocurrency and any number of other things. So dark.fail has a whole list of different sites, some legal, some illegal. At the end of it, though, you've got dark.fail's PGP key because you want to be sure that you're at the right dark.fail site, that you're not getting fished out on that as well. So you can compare PGP keys to make sure everything's right. Not only that, but these links are updated constantly by the criminal groups in case they change. And dark.fail does that as well. So you're constantly getting the correct information. You're constantly able to verify that that information is correct. That becomes the first step of developing trust, other than what we've talked about. That becomes the first step of developing trust on the dark web, okay? From there, you go to a site like Dread. Dread has some of the top security and friction on the planet. So you have to go through their little, you know, dread three minute wait, at which point in time it bumps you over to what I like to call captchas from hell. Most captures you're not going to get through it the first time. I've I've actually spent he had some captures on six, eight months ago that it took me 30 to 45 minutes to be able to get past them. So that's the next thing causing more friction, but it also creates more trust because you know that if you, by God, if you can get through it, you're good to go. Once you're through that, and I'm not going to go through the captures because they're, they're bullshit as it is. Once you get through the captures, ping the site to make sure everything's right, that it's operational and up and alive for that day and everything, you get to the dread main site. And this is the front page there. And what you see is you see basically the Reddit of the dark web. And this is just kind of like the Reddit homepage where it has any number of different types of, uh, <laughs> of 
I'm sorry. I'm, I'm I'm chuckling because I see this. We're going to click on that in just a second. But you see all these different types of topics of people sharing and exchanging information because a lot of the trust that's developed is through the sharing and exchanging the open source of information data that goes on there. And, I, and the reason I was laughing, I saw this guy that he posted, I'm about to get arrested because of refunding. Need help ASAP. And it may be one of the guys that I helped get arrested, which is like 300 for this year. What's he said? He said, I know that sounds stupid, but listen to me. I was refunding and I'm in last phase and I was thinking they will give my money back. Live support suddenly speaking so strange. He was trying to do something, but I can't get it. He said that Amazon account specialists will speak to you. I made a quick search and found out they got what I'm doing. They are fucking, they are fucking about to catch me. What will happen? Guys, please help. So, uh, and of course they start, they start ragging on the guy immediately. This guy says, holy shit. Jeff Bezos is personally getting his hundred dollars back, bro. The cops are on their way. Whoop, whoop. So you see a lot of people that start to uh, start to rag on him, but you probably have some people down here in the thread that start to give some, give the guy some good advice. That advice typically for something like that is, hey, you're you're doing some refunding fraud for a low dollar. Probably Amazon's not going to do a whole lot of hell to you at the end of the day. But the sharing and exchanging of information, and let's type in keyword fraud, okay? And it comes up with ten thousand results, and what we're looking for is one of the subdreads on fraud. There's a subdread on hacking, on malware, on car. There's, there's a subdread on fraud. So we'll go to the subdread and you see the different types of topics that are discussed. Here's a guy that's getting ready for tax season, tax fraud, tax refund fraud the right way. So he's probably going to start giving some advice. That's exactly what he's going to do. He's, start, he's going to share some advice on how to properly commit tax fraud for the 2024 season. If you read this, what am I looking for? Does this guy know what he's talking about? Well, based on my past and my experience and my understanding of tax refunding fraud, which I'm the guy who created that bullshit, based on that, yeah, the guy kind of knows what he's talking about. And I may go up here and I may click on his username, find out some of his history, read some of his other posts. And from that, because a person's screen name becomes their brand, I can start to say, well, I can trust this guy because he knows what he's talking about. At least in this aspect, he knows what he's talking about. Probably in some other areas, he knows what he's talking about as well. And that is how trust is established on the traditional dark web. Okay. You've got this whole forum, this whole large communication channel about sharing and exchanging information that is trusted and used by hundreds of thousands of cyber criminals that are looking to victimize you or your company. Trust is imperative when we're talking about cybercrime. Now, trust works a little bit differently. I want to share one other screen. All right, so trust on the dark web is persistent. It's long lasting. It's it's highly developed and it results in a in an environment that can overall be scammer free, law enforcement free, security professional free and very successful at attacks and cybercrime. Okay? Understand that. Compared to what we're looking at now, Telegram. Telegram, trust is not like that on Telegram. Here we're going to the AIO crime channel for all in one crime. And you'll see it's been a while since I've checked it. It's got uh, it's 136,000 responses since the last time I was on this, uh, this channel. So Telegram, it doesn't have the degree of friction that the traditional dark web has. Telegram is an app which you can run on your phone. You can run it into in a web browser like I'm doing right now. It's encrypted end to end and it has a keyword function. If you're just looking for something, you just type it in the search bar and you got it. You don't have to know. You do not have to know the site or the channel specifically that you're going for. The keyword search function will find the product or service that you're looking to find. And it's encrypted, so it's very safe all the way through. That's one of the reasons, the primary reason, that, that friction-free environment is the primary reason that Telegram today 
is the wild west of cybercrime. Most beginning people start with Telegram. A lot of more experienced people are now migrating to Telegram because that's where a lot of the people are hanging out now. The thing is, is that trust on Telegram isn't as persistent, long lasting or concrete as it is on the traditional dark web. Trust on Telegram is by and large developed through the rapport of the different members that are on Telegram. The bullshitting they do between each other, which is it's 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 interesting. The the rapport of the users is really only on the English speaking side of things. So English speaking cyber criminals really like to talk and they talk too friggin' much. You take a Ukrainian, you take a Russian, when you're on one of their forums or a Telegram channel or something like that, they are only talking about business. On English speaking channels, they're talking about business, yes, but they intermix it with or intertwine it with bullshit. What are you doing today? Oh, I'm not doing anything. What are you doing? I'm not doing anything. So this is the all-in-one crime channel right here. And you see a lot of different advertisements. Let's scroll up here a little bit. All right. So this is the archivist domain. And I wanted to show him today because he sent me a nasty little note the other day on Telegram and he quote unquote, stay the hell out of my channels. And I was like, no. So I'm going to show it again today because yeah, I'm not about to stay out of his channel. This guy, he doxed the head agents of 39 of the 56 FBI field offices. He has uh, posted uh, breach data um, from medical companies. He's posted explosives for sale, any number of things. But what you also see on his channel is a lot of people will post little memes. All right. And if I like your meme enough, hell, I may like your meme enough that I start to like you. And if I like you enough, I may start to trust you. And if I trust you enough, I may start to do business with you. That is the way that trust operates on Telegram. The result is that at least 70 percent of everything that's advertised criminal wise on Telegram is bullshit. It's fake. It's simply a criminal trying to rip off other criminals. Now, you would think 70 percent. Shit, that's a lot of stuff. Yes, it's a lot of stuff, but there's so much crime that happens on Telegram that the 30 percent of legitimate criminal goods, services, products, what have you, the 30 percent is extraordinary. It's a lot. It's a shit ton of stuff. All right. So going back to this idea that we're talking about today, and I was about to put my glasses on for no reason. The idea, once you create that legend, once you go into the environment and you've learned the dynamics of the environment, you've learned how to talk, you've learned you're, you're trusted. You're trusted in that environment. How do you become trusted? You become trusted by creating that legend, by developing rapport with the members, whether that be on Telegram or on the dark web, by creating a brand around your identity. So what I've historically advised in the past for security professionals, law enforcement, things like that is, hey, you know, create this, create your legend. Then you go in, you sit there, you learn, and then finally you start maybe asking some questions. But better than that, because you've got scammers that are on both environments, all these platforms are scammers everywhere. Identify a scammer and then start ragging on them. Start hitting them as hard as you can. You, you attack every single scammer you can because if you're attacking those scammers, it causes people to respond to you. People trust you to point out the scammers. And that trust will be transferred to other things as well. Remember what I pointed out with Dread with the guy talking about tax fraud? I'm going to look him up. I trust him because he knows what he's talking about on tax fraud. Maybe he knows what he's talking about on, on the other stuff. I'm much more likely to trust him on those other topics as well. If I start fingering the scammers, not sexually, mind you, just, you know, pointing them out. If I start pointing out the scammers, then maybe I'll be trusted other places as well. But it becomes more important than that. What I can also do, if I work with a company, if I have proprietary information, I'm not going to post anything proprietary. But if I'm skimming through and scraping data from other platforms as well, if something is mentioned on another platform that can then be valuable on another channel that I'm monitoring, absolutely I'll post that. 
that because it's correct. It's something that anyone could find. It's not proprietary. Yes, it helps educate criminals, but it also, more importantly, gains me a foothold and trust in that specific environment. Once you're trusted enough, then you can start to sow distrust within that environment. You can start to poison that well. Think of it like this. Don't think of it from a one-person point. With me, it was very successful from a one-person point because, you know, I'm Brett Johnson. Eh, but and I'm talking about Shark Tank here. Shark Tank, I they pissed me off. So I decided to pull this experiment. Can I poison a well? And it turned out that I could. They went from 10,000 members to 2,800 in a little over an hour. Very successful. The only thing that happened was, is I don't have the time to continue to fuck around with you guys. So after a week of dismantling them and, and running full blast of this and bam, 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 a one-man army, I was like, give up the ghost. All right, leave them alone. But it, it, it proved that this idea of spoiling the well, poisoning the well, is absolutely a valid idea, not just from one person. If you do that with multiple identities, not only multiple identities, but if you think about law enforcement, law enforcement is very good about arresting people and then sitting them down across the table and looking at them like they did me and saying, hey, well, you know, uh, we don't have to charge you with everything. Anything you can do for us? And at that point, here's the secret. Everybody talks. So that little guy that got arrested on refunding fraud, got arrested on breach data, whatever that little guy got arrested for, he's going to work his little ass off as much as he possibly can to set up everybody else he can. So you've got an asset, an asset that's already trusted in that environment. So here you are, you're coming into that environment with your legends. You're also, if you're law enforcement, you're using those people that are already trusted to come back into the environment, start setting people up. And you start to sow distrust at the same time because you can't arrest everyone. Yeah, you're going to set some people up. But while you're doing that, you're sowing distrust in that whole environment. And we've seen this work before back when uh, Alpha Bay was shut down. So 2017, worldwide law enforcement shut down Alpha Bay. Alpha Bay was the largest criminal group at, a, at that point in time, 240,000 members. They arrested the guy, Alexander Kazaa. He was in Thailand. They put him in a jail there. He promptly hangs himself because he was going to get, bet your little ass on it, he was going to get life in prison. He decided to check out. So he did. He hanged himself in the cell. At that point in time, you had other marketplaces and forums that were active. The most active one was Hansa Market. So law enforcement comes in and they say, all their assets come in and say, you know, we know that Alpha Bay got shut down. Yeah, we're scared shitless about that. But Hansa Market is where everything's migrating. Go over there. Everything's going to be fine. We're going to set up shop over there. So law enforcement, all their assets sent everything over to Hansa Market. Two weeks later, it was announced, well, you know what? We didn't tell you this. We, we got Hansa Market as well a few months back. Yeah, yeah, all those PGP keys, all that bullshit. Yeah, yeah, we got you, we got you. And they started to arrest people. Again, you can't arrest your way out of the problem, but by poisoning those wells, by coming in with Alpha Bay, followed up by Hansa Market, it caused a poison well effect. It created such paranoia and confusion across the dark web as a whole that many of the members decided that they could no longer trust Tor. Where did they go? They went back to the surface web. Where did they go on the surface web? They went to Reddit. Of all fucking places, they went to Reddit, set up shop on Reddit. Reddit let them do it. For six months, you had, you had subreddits dedicated to drugs, fraud, crime, dark web, hundreds of thousands of members on these subreddits. Reddit let it go. These idiot fucking criminals had no idea why they were letting it go. They were just all, all happy-go-lucky. Well, they let it go because it made a very effective honeypot. You could then compare who was talking about what on Reddit to what was going on on the dark web and start arresting more people at that point. Reddit shut it down after about six months in time. It's that poison well effect that I'm talking about today. It is absolutely effective. And I, I truly believe that this is how you disrupt cybercrime communities and environments. And I absolutely believe it can work. So I just wanted to share that with you today. Um, I'm going to start trying to work on a, uh, a group, a community, shit, maybe a business 
that can um, go out, and I'm not sure how the business would make money doing that, a way to go in and poison these wells on these respective platforms. It's very easy to do that on Reddit. On, on Reddit, you don't have the ability to see like timestamps of where people are signing in and out. You don't have the ability to look at devices like you would from server side or anything else like that. And then, um, so it, it's, it's much easier to disrupt and sow discord on Telegram than it is on the traditional dark web, but it can absolutely be done in both places. With that in mind, I think it's time we close things out. I've, I've, it's been a marathon show today. So my name is Brett Johnson. This is Criminal Thoughts. How do we end the show? We end it the same way we do on the other show. <laughs> stay safe, stay secure, stay vigilant. Hey, subscribe if you don't mind and and visit the brett johnson show if you're strictly on criminal thoughts uh the brett johnson show is uh i think it's a good channel i really do it's on youtube it's on other podcast platforms as well we're transitioning the brett johnson show from being that you know the cybersecurity and cyber crime talk to being a show about uh doing better about uh you know th these redemption stories about uh the trials and tribulations of trying to be a better person do better in life overall um why because that's really what I find valuable in life is that. And certainly we get value from cybercrime, cybersecurity, and, and crime in general on both sides of the fence. Tune into that. See if you like it. Leave me some comments as well. I pay attention to those. I often respond to those. Stay safe. Stay secure. Stay vigilant. More importantly, this is Criminal Thoughts. At the end of the day, just do the right damn thing. I'm Brett Johnson. Thank you so much for tuning in. Until next time.